I said yesterday that Charles Leclerc looked really, really good on race runs and uh, indeed he was quickest as far as I could see on race runs and on the soft tyre as well. And so it proved today he was really good under pressure too. Ferrari left it pretty late to get out there to do a time. They were trying to get a free lap all the time and Charles delivered under pressure in every moment of qualifying and his time 14.7 I think was the absolute limit and to out qualify his teammate by 0.3 in Q2 says well it says everything you need to say about Charles Leclerc because as we said before Carlos Sainz isn't slow if one thing he is he's a quick racing driver and there's Charles just showing his class and showing his quality manipulating the car very much as the way Lewis Hamilton does and a great performance I thought from Ferrari and from Charles and I think the sum total of that was that in Q1 Charles was able to stay in the garage and yet Carlos Sainz had to go out and do a second run in Q1 and that's you know that's okay he's new to the team but that does again point to the quality of the driving of Charles Leclerc but let's not forget at this point Lando Norris at McLaren Mercedes he's been brilliant all weekend I did a video at the start of the year and I'll put the put the link in the description comparing Lando with Daniel as they go into this 2021 face-off and for me it's been the most interesting comparison between two drivers in one team on the entire grid. Lando Norris has not disappointed in any department. He looks so good on soft tires, in race runs, in traffic, starts. He's just an all-embracing racing driver. And here's the news. Lando Norris was almost on the pole for this race. He lost that lap because of running wide through turn nine. But if you look at the aerial shot of how much extra road he used, you're looking at, I don't know, probably about that much over the, uh, over the allowed distance. So, okay, let's give him, let's take a tenth away. Forget about the deletion of the lap time. Let's just wonder how much lap time he gained by that. Let's say a tenth, he still would have been right up there. Absolutely superb job by Lando. He must be pretty crestfallen by now, I would think, because having dominated Daniel Ricciardo all weekend and having looked as if he was going to qualify top three, he actually will be starting the race now in seventh place behind Daniel. One of the things that surprised me though was that McLaren didn't put Lando on the medium tyre for Q2. He had the pace, he pretty clearly had the pace after everything we saw in free practice this morning. And to have him on two sets of soft tyres, yeah, it uh, certainly put him very near the pole in Q3. He didn't have to go through that transition. But equally, now that he's had that slight disappointment, he's starting just behind Daniel on the same tyres, a soft tyre. So at least it would have been some compensation if he'd been on the medium yellow tyre. But I've got to say, considering he was nowhere and looked to be in trouble, the last run by Daniel Ricciardo to come out and do that lap time and get into the game was a brilliant performance under pressure as well. And it goes back to what I was saying at the start of the year. In terms of a driver pairing, a driver combination, Lando Norris, Daniel Ricciardo, whichever way around you want to say it, absolutely superb. And I think McLaren and Mercedes are moving forward with every race because of the quality of that driver combination. With Yuki out in Q1, Alfa Tori Honda, which is a very quick car as well, represented uniquely by Pierre Gasly. Now, very frustrating qualifying for Pierre because like Lando, he kept running slightly wide out of turn nine, having lap times deleted, but he got there in the end. In the global picture of things, Alfa Tori will be happy with P5, but it looks as if they could have got a little bit more out of that car and as a team if the drivers hadn't made so many mistakes. As for Valtteri Bottas, well, if you look at point three, the difference between the two Ferrari drivers, and that got one of them into Q3 and the other was relegated, then point four was the difference between Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas in Q3. You thought in the first run that Valtteri had made a few mistakes, ran wide, but he kept doing it on the second run as well, particularly at Aqua Minerale, didn't look good. He's got this thing where he goes through the kink flat, but then finds that he cannot, a bit like Sebastian Vettel, then the tight bit where you have to start braking. It's a really impressive bit of road. He always seems to run out of road there if he's gone through that kink absolutely flat. Whereas Lewis has got this ability to go through the kink, move the car slightly and give him a slightly flatter, straighter braking area into the main part of Aqua Minerale. To me, that was the difference between Lewis and Valtteri. I don't think on chicanes there was a lot of difference. I don't think through Toza, through the left-hander, there was much. Maybe through the top of the hill there. I found that turn nine, that left-hander at the top of the hill, always quite a difficult corner. Even going back to the old days of Imola, a difficult corner on which to judge anything really. The cars all look great there. The drivers all look great there. And all we're doing is looking at how much room they're using coming out of the corner. You never really see much attitude of the cars going in. But down the hill is just is classic Imola. And that's a great place, 
I think, to watch and to look at the way drivers are manipulating the car. And that was the key area for me, uh, the difference between Lewis and Valtteri. What Lewis was doing through that kink before Ackerman Rally and what Valtteri wasn't doing through that kink. It wasn't the actual main part of Aqua Minerale. It was how they prepared for it. And that was the difference. Um, wow, point four as well. I'm sure there were other bits too. I'm sure Valtteri probably, he was down on time. He probably ran a bit wide coming out of the last couple of corners as well. Speaking of which, Kimi Raikkonen had a big moment going into those last two corners, that double apex left uh, in the morning. And it reminded me, I think it was about his first Grand Prix, certainly his first year with Sauber, exactly the same place going into that double apex left. The steering wheel or the steering column broke on the Sauber and he went in with no steering whatsoever. It was a little bit like the same thing that happened today. It just went straight on, didn't damage the car very much. But um, yeah, I just thought, wow, that's a weird thing for Kimi. You know, that's how long... He's been around. Uh, let's look at some of the other results because there were some extraordinary things going on between teammates. If you look at Lance Stroll, P10, Sebastian Vettel, P13 in Q2, again, you know, Vettel went out, did a lap time that put him just ahead of Lance, and then Lance went out again and was three tenths quicker. So, you know, you've got to say, Sebastian, what is going on? He, he's still got this thing where he brakes incredibly late, incredibly hard. He needs the car just to turn in when he wants. And as I say, like Botas, he was just running out of road constantly into Ackerman Rally, expecting that car to tuck its nose in just as he did the wheel, but ain't going to happen. Uh, whereas Stroll was uh, doing much more manipulation and looked much more fluid over the lap in terms of edges and, and moving the car forward than Sebastian Vettel. So no surprise in the difference there. Let's hear it for Nicholas Latifi, who with George Russell got through into Q2, both Williams into Q2, neither Alfa Romeo making it into Q2. So there, I've been saying for a while now how improved the Alphas are. And I've got to say here, I don't think Antonio Giovinazzi got the best from the car. He certainly got into a traffic melee with Nikita Mazepin right at the end, but he shouldn't be leaving it that late. But for Williams to out-qualify Alpha, I think excellent performance. And for Nicholas Latifi to be quicker than George Russell in Q1, let me repeat that. Nicholas Latifi to be quicker than George Russell in Q1, amazing performance. The two Williams drivers then ran the medium tyre, I guess to do a bit of testing, see how it felt. And then both of them went out on soft tyres at the end of Q2. And would you believe, but for a couple of tenths, one of them might have made it through into Q3. It was a really, really good day for Williams and certainly not before time. Great to see. Not a great day for Alpine, formerly Renault, if you're expecting to be in the high midfield. Esteban Ocon just made it through into Q3. Fernando Alonso, P15 in Q2, no chance to get through into Q3. Um, of this, you can probably say about Fernando, he's still a great racer and he'll be spectacular tomorrow. But that speed difference between Ocon and Fernando is starting to become relatively significant and relatively consistent. It'll be interesting to see how Fernando reacts to that and how he develops. I guess he's going to get better. But uh, right now, if you're a Fernando Alonso fan, which I am, it's a bit of a worry, got to say. So congratulations to Sir Lewis Hamilton. Congratulations to Sergio after that incident yesterday, that collision with Esteban Ocon to come back to qualify second ahead of Max Verstappen in the same car. Very impressive. And to Max Verstappen as well, of course. He's on the medium tyre like Lewis. Didn't have a great qualifying. Will be different in the race. But Sergio Perez will be the driver they'll be thinking of because that red tyre does have longevity, as I mentioned yesterday, and it will give Sergio that grip off the line from the dirty side of the grid. First chicane should be interesting.